he won't be satisfied with anything ordinary we won't be satisfied at all we won't be satisfied with anything ordinary we won't be satisfied at all we won't be satisfied with anything ordinary we won't be satisfied at all no 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 we won't be satisfied with anything ordinary we won't be satisfied at all we won't be satisfied with anything
Yes, Lord. 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 You're worthy, God. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. I'd rather be no place I'd rather be there's no place I'd rather be than here in your love here in your love there's no place I'd rather be there's no place I'd rather be there's no place I'd rather be than here in your love here in your love there's no place I'd rather be no place I'd rather be here. There's no place I'd rather be than here in your love, here in your love. There's no place I'd rather be here. There's no place I'd rather be here. There's no place I'd rather be than here in your love, here in your love. Oh, there's no
words in our heart to express to you the love that we have for you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. It's great to have you with us today, our friends in Denton and Keller, you guys at Eagle Mountain Lake and everyone online. So excited that you've chosen to be with us for the last week of our Healer Series. It's been an unbelievable series and it crescendos today and so we're really, really glad that you're here. Before we get into the message, a couple of things. One is, I just want to tell you how blessed and encouraged I know we all were uh, by the ministry the Lord did last week through Alan Smith. Alan Smith is a dear, dear friend, a partner in the gospel. He has done so much to help me and my family through the years. And I'm so glad that we could share his gift with you. I know you were blessed and encouraged. And I just want to say this. I want to strongly encourage you to come and be a part of our Unveiled Conference that Alan's going to lead here in a few weeks. Uh, there's information in your program. You can sign up online. If you go out to the Welcome Center, they'll tell you about it. But here's the deal, man. At Cross Timbers, our deal is kind of we wait till the last minute. And I, I get that about this and have kind of this love-hate relationship with us about that. Can I encourage you today to go out and sign up? Join Mike and I at the Unveiled Conference. You go, well, I can't come for the whole thing. Well, guess what? My son is graduating on Saturday, and I won't get there for the whole thing on Saturday, but I'll be there for the biggest portion of it. So don't let anything keep you from coming. Turn right now, wives, turn right now to your husband and say, come on, man, we're going. Tell them that you're going to come. I'd like to see a lot of our college students, our high school students coming as well. I think it's going to be a tremendous blessing. United students, our young adults, y'all come and be a part of the Unveiled Conference. I think it's going to bless you. It's going to encourage you. It's going to stretch you a bit. And I, I, I'm really, really excited about it. Now, I was out of town, as you know, last week. In fact, I've just flown back. I've been over in Europe and spending some time with some pastors around the world. And one of the great blessings of, uh, of the opportunity that this uh, family affords me, to, that, that we have a kingdom perspective and that they'll allow me to go and, and do these kind of things. But the greatest blessing for me, honestly, is I get extended periods of time by myself. Uh, that doesn't happen much at home. Uh, for a, a myriad of reasons, but when I travel, I think one of the greatest blessings is I spent 11 hours and seven minutes this past Thursday on an airplane with nobody else I knew, and I get to spend some concentrated time alone with the Lord. And as I was reading the Bible on this trip, and I really wasn't preparing for a message, I wasn't trying to get ready for something I was going to do at home, I was just having just a time with God, just me and, and the Lord, and I was reading a passage of Scripture that stopped me dead in my tracks. And I want to tell you, this isn't in the notes. It wasn't a part of, of what I was going to teach today. But there are times that, that there's almost, it's almost like an electric shock goes through your body when you read something. You go, man, the Lord is speaking that just to you. Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever just read something? Well, I, I believe it's the Lord. And, and uh, so I, I want to share it with you today. And then I want, I want to pray with you. Because I think it answers a question that some of you are having. Some of you maybe that have been here a long time or that are brand new and you go, man, we're teaching. I hear Toby talking about all this supernatural stuff and where is Cross Timbers going and what are we doing? And so I want to share my heart with you about that and then we'll get right into the message. Okay, the passage comes in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and you might just want to write this down and look it up later as I said it wasn't a part of the message it's not going to come up on the screen but in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 Paul is talking about his preaching and he says this he says I resolved to know nothing while I was with you talking to the church at Corinth except Jesus Christ and him crucified I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling 
My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. So that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. So I'm just going to say it as we begin today. We live in a country and we live in a metroplex that celebrates a good show on Sunday. As the room goes silent. But we like to come to church and when I, we, all of us, and we like to sit back and go, man, were the worship songs good? How was the lighting? Did, did the worship leader make me feel something? Think, think about this. Because again, I'm not convicting you, I'm convicting all of us. It's we have this lens in the American church of that's kind of how we view a Sunday morning service, right? You know, I'm telling the truth. And then it's the preacher gets up. And did he make me laugh? Did he make me think? Uh, did he entertain me? You know, entertainment literally means you hold someone's attention for a certain amount of time. And in the Metroplex, if I can just say it today... Many people jump from experience to experience to experience in local churches based on who's leading worship and how great the teacher is. That's just how it is, right? And if we're not careful, here's what church becomes. It becomes an experience of great worship, great singing, and eloquent precepts that cause us to try to be something more than we're being. And then you read Paul and he says, you know what? I came to you in weakness and fear and trembling. I wasn't much. I think that's what I first began to connect with this passage because I don't feel like I'm much. But, but the reason he said we come together, it's not for great singing or great, wor great words from the a church leader. It's it's a demonstration of God's power. It's that God shows up. If the presence of God doesn't show up and, and God isn't able to, to do everything he wants to do, we're missing the fullness of God. And so my heart for this place is that it would not be built on the abilities or talents of me or anybody else up front with wise and persuasive or entertaining words, but that we might experience God's power. That's my heart for us. So what does that look like? I don't have any stinking idea. I don't think it has to be weird. I, I don't think it has to be a feeling or emotion. I, I just think for people who are who know Christ and are filled with the Spirit of Christ, it becomes authentic. And people far from God are drawn to God. Not wise and persuasive words, my friends, but with a manifestation of God's power. So let's pray, and then we'll get into what I prepared for today, okay? Father, our heart longs for your power. Our heart longs for you to do something in us that we can't do for ourselves. And, and I, I do not want this experience to be about wise and persuasive words. I want it to be a demonstration of your power. Because I don't want my faith to rest on somebody's ability or wisdom, but in you. And so help us in that today, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we've been talking, for those of you who've been with us or those of you who might need a little catching up, we've been talking about God's shalom, the, the wholeness of God, that God's heart is to bring health into our lives relationally, emotionally, spiritually. And today we 
We end this series with probably the most controversial part of God's healing power, which is God's ability and desire to heal us spiritually. Psalm 103, the, the, the passage that is the basis for this series says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, and who heals all your diseases. And in this passage, we find this, that Jesus is both Savior who forgives our sins, and he is our healer who heals our sickness, our malady. So we find early in scripture a foundational principle. Listen, Jesus is the author of wholeness. That, that anything, every good and perfect gift that we receive as Paul writes comes from above. The, the author of our healing relationally, emotionally, spiritually, and physically is Jesus Christ. And it's interesting to me when we think about it that most Christians that I meet, most Christians I meet have no issue with Jesus being our spiritual healer. By his stripes, we've been healed. We read all of the New Testament passages about how we're forgiven in Christ, how God makes us complete in Christ. We sing about it. We weep about it. We raise our hands about it. We love it. And the response to the last couple of weeks is we've talked about emotional healing here. And I shared my personal testimony and talked about the Lord touching me and heard from so many of you about how the Lord used that to bless you. And Alan last weekend about emotional healing and it's about us finding the right source, which was unbelievable teaching. And we love that. But we come to physical healing and for some reason, we put that in another category, don't we? For some reason... Those of us who have no issue with God healing spiritually or emotionally, we begin to wonder if God heals physically. Why is that? That's a great question. We're going to get to that in just a moment. But as we begin today, let me just state this, and I want you to write down some of these verses because I don't want my opinion. We want a biblical foundation for is it the heart of God to heal? And unequivocally, I would tell you from Genesis to Revelation— the Bible, the foundational truth of the Bible is the answer to that question is a resounding yes. God's heart is to bring healing into your life. Why do you ask? Well, I'm glad that you asked. Write these things down and check me out on them. Go read these verses for yourself. Number one, we know God wants to heal because we know that he has compassion for his children. You see the compassion exhibited in the person of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 9 Write that down, Matthew 9, the Bible says, Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing disease and sickness among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them. Matthew 14, and when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them, and he healed their sick. He healed their sick spiritually, emotionally and he brought physical healing into your life why do I believe that God does heal and wants to heal because I know that he has compassion for his children anyone who is in a state of listen this ease anyone who is not yet to experience the wholeness of God so I know that Jesus is compassionate that's the first reason biblically I would tell you that I believe God wants to heal secondly though I believe in the goodness of the father not only the compassion of Christ, but the goodness of the Father. Matthew 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? James 1, 7, every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of, of lights. Why do you believe, Toby, that God heals today? Because I believe God is good. Listen, and he loves to give good gifts to his kids. So you got the compassion of Christ, the goodness of the Father. And then when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, listen, you see the willingness of Jesus. Matthew chapter 8. And behold, a leopard came and worshiped him, saying, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Then the Lord put his hand on him and touched him, saying, I love this, I am willing and be cleansed. Immediately, the leprosy was cleansed. And then a centurion from Capernaum comes to him, says, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed. And Jesus said, I'm going to come and heal him. 
that it, God is not only able to heal, God not only feels our pain, but God is willing to heal. Now, next, and I hope you're writing some of this down. I, I want you to see in Scripture, you know, we've been throwing this word around a lot this year, presence-based ministry, right? And we've been talking about how we know God is everywhere, but we want God here, right? We want the manifest presence of God. Come on, somebody, who wants the manifest presence of God in their life? Okay, the manifest presence of God. I want to show you from Scripture a couple of places where Physical healing is many times tied to the manifest presence of God. Physical healing is tied to the manifest presence of God. Now it happened, Luke chapter 6, on a certain day, that as he was teaching, there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come from every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. Listen to this. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And then Luke 6, and the whole multitude sought to touch him, for power went out from healed and healed them all. There, there is, there's a healing many times that that comes out of God's presence. That, that's why we don't sing songs to hurry up and get to the message, right? That's, that's not our mentality. We, 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 want, we want to worship God in spirit and in truth. We want to confess his name. Why? Because the Bible says in that time of heartfelt worship, here comes the presence of God, right? And in the presence of God is God's ability to heal us. And so if, if, you, if you believe like we believe here that, that, there's, a, that there, there's, an, a, there's a, an opportunity, if you will, to experience the manifest presence of God. A result of that is, many times, physical healing. Emotional healing, obviously spiritual healing, but it's connected to, uh, to physical healing in the manifest presence of God. And then, I, I would say this to you, we believe at Cross Timbers that all the gifts of the Holy Spirit are available today, right? We believe that. If you've been to our welcome class here at Cross Timbers, I think it's called... Something starting point now, I used to teach it as a welcome class, but our starting point class, one of the things you'll learn, go to our website. We believe all the gifts of the Spirit are available today. And when you begin to study the gifts of the Spirit, one of the gifts given, the Bible tells us, is the gift of healing. To another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 9 through 10. I'm just kind of going there today, right? I'm just laying this out for you. But, but we believe that all the gifts of the Spirit are available today. So, so, Toby, do you believe that some people have been gifted to be able to lay hands on someone? And there's a, there's a special anointing, which is just a church word for unction, ability to heal someone unequivocally, yes, I do believe that. But I don't believe that that gift given to one person excludes the rest of us for praying for people for healing. I believe that the Bible teaches some have been given the gift of faith. And I can tell you, I personally know some people on our staff who have gone through some incredibly difficult moments. And in those moments, there's a gift of faith that has been poured out in their lives. But I don't mean, I, and I believe that God gives that gift to people for certain seasons, the gift of faith in their life. But it doesn't mean that the rest of us don't live out of faith, right? I believe some are given the gift of evangelism, that it's just something about people that they're able to reach lots of people for Christ. But I think all of us are supposed to be in the, in, in the evangelizing process. We're all supposed to be sharing our faith with people, right? But one of the clear giftings of the Spirit is a gift of healing. And so... There are some who I believe in seasons of their life are given special unction or anointing from the Lord to be able to pray in faith and see God move, but it doesn't mean the rest of us are never supposed to pray for people to get healed. The, the call of God in our life is for all of us to begin to believe that God can heal physically, relationally, emotionally, and spiritually and ask God to do that. And then don't put God in a box for the way that he does it. When you begin to read from the ministry of Christ, you find all kind of unconventional ways that people are touched by Jesus. 
So let me refute a couple of arguments quickly today, all right? Well, your faith determines whether or not you get healed. Well, then you explain to me how somebody came to Jesus and said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, and Jesus touched them. That sometimes God heals, listen, because of great faith, sometimes God heals in spite of great faith. Don't put your focus on the faith, put your focus on the God who brings the healing. This is a place the enemy comes. I'm not going to pray for somebody to get well, because if they don't get well, it's a bad reflection on me. I know people in our church that have prayed for people to get well and they haven't gotten well. And so they've just decided God doesn't supernaturally heal anymore. Let me say this about that. I, as a pastor, have prayed thousands of times for people to get healed. Sometimes they get healed and sometimes they don't. But it, the only way the enemy wins in that is if I quit praying for people's healing. If I start looking for natural answers to supernatural problems. That's where the enemy wins. Faith, God heals because of faith. And sometimes God heals in spite of great faith. Because it ain't about you, it's about him. Well, every healing that God gave was complete. I read that just this week. Some commentator sold a commentary trying to tell everybody there's no place that God doesn't bring complete healing. Really? Let's go read about Jesus Christ talking to a blind guy. God touches him and says, now can you see? He says, well, yeah, I see people, but they look like trees walking around. They look like, now, now think about this theology. God in the flesh, connected to his Father, filled with the Holy Spirit, touches a guy, and he heals him halfway. And so Jesus touches him again, and now he can see clearly. If the Son of God sometimes experienced like progressive healing, that there was a season of healing and it wasn't everything you asked for, but it was a, a piece of what we were asking for and then brings more healing. If it happens for God, why would it not happen for us? And we start throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Well, I remember the first time someone prayed for me that my back would be healed. And they prayed that I had someone pray for me. And actually, it was a group of pastors when I first started hanging out with some pastors who believed in the power of the Holy Spirit. And let's pray for you. And I literally was able to stand up tall. And being a young pastor, I'm, you know, I'm singing from the rooftops. Man, God healed me. And I had people saying to me, well, if, if you never have back trouble again, then I'll believe that God healed you. Give it 10 years. That's ridiculous. God might touch you for a season and for a moment to experience something in your life. And then he, he, might, he might bring another level of healing in your life. And he might not. Why wouldn't God just completely heal? I ain't got any idea. I'm not God. You know, there, there, there's a mystery to God in his sovereignty. And again, if you weren't with us a couple of weeks ago, I think it's important. You guys remember this. I said, you know, you got to hold two tensions in your hand. You got to hold in your hand that it is God's heart to heal and that God sanctifies through suffering. And there is a God. We're not him. Our call is not to explain what God is doing. It's to believe in the power of God's ability to heal so that our walk with Christ does not become about words and knowledge and how much we know the Greek and how we can diagram the New Testament backwards, but a demonstration of God's power. And then there's a faith that's built in you and I when we ask God to do something and we see God saying not yes to that prayer, but yes to another prayer that brings incredible power into your lives. You know, one of my favorite passages about physical healing comes out of John's gospel, the fifth chapter. Because I love the passages that uh, don't seem to perfectly fit in the New Testament. They don't, they don't wrap it all up in a tidy bow. And this, this, is the, this is the story in John chapter 5 of Jesus healing a man by a pool. The Bible says this, Jesus, sometime later, John 5 verse 1, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for the feast of the Jews. Now there was, there is in Jerusalem near the sheep gate a pool, which in Aramaic, 
Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five colored colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. One was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. Are you seeing a theme in these stories that we're reading? They've been sick. We read a few weeks ago about a man that was tormented by by a, a demon and it had been going on for a long time this woman in her life and she's kept coming back to the temple you remember this this 38 years when jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time he asked him do you want to get well do you really want to get well you know i think that's a question jesus asked us many times do, do you want to get well uh Do you want me to touch your life? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into this pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes up ahead of me. He doesn't answer Jesus' question. Jesus says, do you want to get well? And he says, let me give you all the excuses why it's not happening. I know this isn't sounding familiar to any of you. You would never do this. You, you would never, you, listen, you, you would never enjoy wallowing in your pain. You never want to use your physical, relational, emotional challenge as an excuse for doing nothing, for lying there. I know we'd never do that. And if Jesus would come and say, hey, do you really want to get well? I know that none of us would ever use an excuse why it's everybody else's fault that we're in the situation that we're in. But this is what this man does. And Jesus says to him, get up. Pick up your mat and walk. And at once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and walked. Now let me tell you a couple of reasons this story has always meant much to me. I'm going to give you the the positive side and then I'm going to give you the challenging side. The, The positive side for me is the fact that, I just faked our camera guys out. I went that way and now I'm going this way. Um. Is it that in spite of this man's insecurities, in spite of this evidently kind of addiction to to a victim mentality, in in spite of all of his excuses, Jesus broke through and touched him. I, I like that because sometimes I have a victim mentality and sometimes I have a lot of excuses. Sometimes I'm not where I need to be And Jesus is willing to touch me anyway. We believe that God gives grace and mercy at the cross as it relates to our spiritual healing. Why would we not believe God gives grace and mercy to us in our emotional and physical healing? So so I love that about the story. but, But here's the part of the story that bothers me. I've never heard anybody teach about before. Probably because you can't wrap this up in a bow and give an answer. But, but here's the thing. How many people does the Bible indicate that are lying there at the pool? I mean, the indication in John chapter 5 in Scripture is that a great number of disabled people are lying there. Jesus, here's what I want God to do. I want God to come and I want him to do this. I'm going to just take off his cloak and just wave it and everybody fall and everybody be healed because I've seen that on TV. That was funny. Come on. That's what I want. I want God, but you know what? In, in that, listen, Jesus stepped over many disabled people and he didn't heal the crowd. He just healed one. Now some scholars would say this is early in his ministry and we're sure that Jesus came back. To that pool again well maybe and maybe not so let me tell you what I think was happening there look at me there was a moment in the season of time where it was this guy's time and so Jesus touched him well why didn't Jesus touch everybody else I have no idea I just know that he touched the one and I the reason I tell you that today is that because I think many times because of past experience because of disappointment that God didn't do it the way we wanted it done. That we become people, I want you to hear me, that unknowingly 
block God's power to do something in our lives because we quit asking. If God wanted to, in whatever room you're sitting in today, God could come and he could touch everybody. But maybe it's a season, it's a moment for one. I'm going to tell you this. <laughs> the only way you're not going to experience the healing touch of Jesus is if you don't ask him. The only way I can guarantee you that Jesus will never touch your body supernaturally is if you don't ask. Full of faith, full of doubt. <laughs> On top of the mountain, in the valley. With all the answers or all the questions. A spiritual giant or a spiritual midget. You, you can't put it in a box. Go read, the, go read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You can't put it in a box. For every argument you'll give me on one side, I'll show you an example that doesn't fit your argument. Because <laughs> God is a God of mystery. God is not a God of formulas or programs. He's a God of mystery. But I do know this. I know that the heart of God is for people to experience healing. And I know this, I know that the Bible teaches me that part of the promise of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the power of the Holy Spirit to do powerful things in our lives. And I refuse to go, well, he's going to do this and he's going to do this, but he will never do this. So hear me, look at me. By his stripes... We are healed. So here's what we're going to do today. At all of our campuses right now, you'll see people headed toward the back. They're headed toward the back not because they're trying to leave early, but because they're going to pass out communion. Because I thought one of the greatest ways we could end this series is claiming the blood of Jesus, not just to heal our souls, but to heal our physical bodies. So we're going to take a little cracker, represents Jesus' body that the Bible says was broken on the cross. I like to say here, Jesus' body was broken so that we don't have to live broken lives anymore. And then we're going to take a little cup of juice that represents his blood that was shed. And in the middle of it, by faith, we're going to ask him to begin to do something in our lives that we haven't been able to do for ourselves. And then, and then here's the deal about cross timbers. And I'm going to pray and we'll get into this, but just heart to heart for a minute. In the campuses that I get to go to, one of the things, uh, lots of times that happens is Toby's through preaching, it's time to go. I, and I, and uh, I'm just stating what I see happening. And, and here's, here's what I want to say to you. I want to encourage you today because we're going to take communion. And as we take communion, we're going to have just people who are committed to pray come to the front of all of our, all of our rooms. And I know Brian and Jamie are going to join Blake out there at uh, Eagle Mountain. And I know, Danny, you've got part of your team that's going to come in Denton. And I know uh, Matt Ferguson, you've got some folks there in uh, Keller. Ross, I don't know if you're playing right now, but I know this is your heart. You can come and join these guys down front. And here's what I encourage you to do. If, if, if you've got something physical that, that you, you, you want the Lord to touch, as, as, as we begin to take communion together and celebrate that by his stripes we're healed, I want to encourage you to come. I want you to encourage you to come and, and ask somebody to pray for you. Uh, I'm not saying that as you come today, everybody's going to get healed. I would love that if the Lord would see fit to do that. Uh, but when, when I read the Bible, there are very few times I see that everybody in the room got healed. But, but, but I'm, I'm saying this, this could be your day. This could be the moment that as the presence of God, His manifest power comes as we... Figuratively speaking, gather around this table. This might be your moment. The only way I can guarantee you it won't be your moment is if you get in your car and go home. <laughs> so let's just, let's just see what the Lord does. Let's just kind of be an open-ended end to this service today. And let's just see what the Lord does. Let's, uh, let's share in communion together. And then let's, uh, let's pray for each other. And, and, and let's, whatever happens, listen to me. Let's give God all the glory. Let's believe that he's at work. Right? That he's at work. And, and maybe he's going to touch you physically and maybe he's going to touch your soul. But let's don't be people that have not because we ask not. Let's pray.
Father, I thank you uh, for what you have been teaching us about your heart for healing. And I, I'm praying today, Father, just for a simple faith. A faith that doesn't have all the answers. But, but a simple faith to say, Lord, if you're willing, you can do this. And so, Father, for everyone hearing the sound of my voice in this moment, I claim the healing power of Jesus. And I would pray, Father, that for many today, this would be the moment where you'd bring physical healing. But Lord, you're a creative God. You're beyond anything I could say or imagine. And so I just say this, may your will be done in our lives today as we worship you in the Lord's Supper. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.